Um, it's a privilege to introduce my, my friend and colleague, Rachel Talbot Ross. Um, her work and leadership have made those who are discriminated against and those who are incarcerated become valued people to their families, to each other, to the community, and most of all, to themselves. She supported them to advocate for themselves and each other and to find their voice. Much of the legislation we have in criminal justice and judiciary, as well as some of the other committees, are a result of her organizing and her leadership and will change the laws that have made people victims instead of honoring each individual's worth and dignity. So welcome, Rachel, and thank you for joining us. So good morning. I want to sit with some of the words that have already been spoken um, and take them in uh, in acknowledgement of the space that we're sharing together um, today. I want to thank Julia um, and Penny. Um, really just such an honor uh, to work in the same space. And uh, for Penny, um, a cherished friendship really for life was born out of our uh, service uh, in the state legislature. So I wanna really just um, appreciate and honor uh, your leadership, Penny. Um, most of what you've just talked about um, would never be possible if you had not been there as well. Um, so I wanna thank you for that. Um, it's good to see a couple of friends. Um, hi, Trudy. Um, <laughs> and uh, just, uh, to uh, really think about what Marilyn had said about what matters utterly uh, in the enormity of the universe, right? Um, so thank you, Marilyn, for those words. Yeah. Um, I really um, feel like I'm amongst friends, so I'll just talk very candidly about some of the um, work that not only I am involved in, but all of you, and uh, what's taking place at the Maine State Legislature. And also I think we'll talk a little bit about the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous and Maine Tribal Populations. Um, Musan has been um, an active participant in the public policy uh, process in Augusta. So I know many of you are very familiar with the structure of the legislature, but I'll give you a, a very, very quick overview. Uh, the Maine State Legislature uh, is a, co-equal branch of government, along with the executive branch, which is all of our state agencies and the governor's office uh, and the judicial branch. Uh, but we, all, we are all co-equal branches of government. Um, the Maine State Legislature is comprised of two chambers, the Senate uh, and the House. It totals 156 members. Um, we are uh, led, if you will, uh, in a traditional sense, structurally um, by um, a legislative council. That legislative council is kind of like uh, an executive committee for an organization. The legislative council um, is chaired by our presiding officers, the Senate president, which is Troy Jackson, uh, and our speaker of the house, which is Ryan Frechter. From there, leg council members make up leadership. Uh, you've got the majority and minority leaders of both parties, the Democratic and Republican Party. So there's about 10 people who serve on this executive committee for the Maine State Legislature. And I am proud uh, for the 130th legislature to be able to serve as the assistant uh, majority leader in the House uh, and a member of Ledge Council. There are 18, uh, <laughs> there are 18 committees. Uh, that comprise uh, the 18 joint standing committees, I'll say that, uh, that comprise and make up the main state legislature. And because the Democrats have a trifecta, uh, which means we control the executive branch, the Senate and the House, uh, all of the chairs of our committees are Democrats. The, the Senate chair and the House chair are Democrats. When I first started in the main state legislature four years ago, two terms ago, um, uh, the Republicans were in control of the executive uh, and uh, the, the House. And so there was a Senate chair that was Republican and a House chair that was Democrat. But since we have the trifecta, we've, uh, we, we co-chair uh, each committee. Um, a really good website for you to look at uh, the list of committees and who's co-chairing those committees. The members of those committees uh, are just at uh, the legislature.main.gov. 
um, I would encourage you to check that site out uh, because the, uh, excuse me, the best way to stay informed about um, all of the legislative activity is to go on there, pull down the, the, the list of committees and then sign up as an interested party on any one of those committees that Musan will be monitoring uh, this legislative session. Uh, by signing up to the interested parties list, you'll be able to get real-time information on bills uh, that will be discussed um, and the agenda. And you also get access to any reports or materials or information that have been distributed to legislators. Um, and so it's really important if you're interested in criminal justice to go on there and sign up for the interested parties list. Um, the way, you know, that um, we will be doing things will be different this time around, right? Um, and I think that after Wednesday's events that they may even get uh, further restricted. Um, but the, you know, themes for this state legislature, you know, are really what's on your minds right now. The overarching themes for this 130th uh, will be a response to uh, the pandemic. And when I say the pandemic, I, I mean relief for COVID, absolute relief uh, for the harm and the suffering of COVID uh, has uh, unleashed and systemic racism. Uh, embedded in systemic racism is of course uh, tribal sovereignty. So the overarching themes um, that will guide at least the democratic agenda, uh, and I have full confidence that it will, uh, is relief and um, looking at systemic racism. The way that we're actualizing that right now in real time uh, is on Monday, uh, the presiding offices, uh, Senator Jackson and Representative Becto are holding a press conference um, that will announce LD1. LD1 is an omnibus package for relief of COVID. Um, and I think you'll find in it, um, it you will see that the, the, the legislative initiative for COVID relief is, is really seen in the governor's budget. She just released yesterday. Uh, and at some point, you know, I'd love to come back and talk to you more about the governor's budget. Um, but it, it, you'll see the legislative bill, LD1, and then you can see where the governor in her biennial budget um, is, is also covering through federal relief funds of uh, totaling about $7.6 billion is coming into the state. Uh, you'll see that match. So LD1 is around COVID recovery. Uh, LD2, which will be released later in the week, I'm pleased to say is a bill um, that requires the inclusion of racial impact statements in the legislative process. So you are gonna see the optics are, LD1 is COVID relief, we must, right? LD2, will be to uh, institutionalize a tool that gets at structural racism. We are now gonna analyze data so that whenever a bill is, is put forth, we get to look at where it, where it lands in terms of disrupting racial disparities. Will it further the disparity? Will it keep the disparity norm, at the norm? Or will it help us decrease the disparity? This is an essential tool, uh, like a fiscal analysis or like an environmental analysis, we are now gonna do a racial analysis so that moving forward, we're not continually to uh, adopt uh, racist policies that only fuel um, a disproportionate impact for the most marginalized in our state. At some point, um, I will introduce um, another form of an impact statement, which is really around um, gender bias, around uh, socioeconomic status, so that we can begin to analyze in, in very real terms, data-driven terms, looking at outcomes, um, how we are to adopt policy that doesn't further the harm. But I didn't include it in this particular bill because we like to scapegoat race, right? I mean, I think that the, with the unfortunate events of Wednesday and I sobbed in my home 
as a as a black woman, I was sobbing and grieving. I was checking on my child who's nowhere near Washington, DC. Uh, my mother was checking on me as her daughter throughout the day, nowhere near Washington, DC, but the fear and impact and magnitude of this puts, uh, it re-traumatizes you. As a black mother, I got re-traumatized um, and I feel the grief in my bones. So this work is, is really um, critical right now for us to not take our eyes off of that. I, I really feel like in some ways after George Floyd's murder and all of the daily, you know, the, the world responded. And then came a time when all of a sudden it went away again, right? Kind of like after each one of these mass shootings in the United States where we grieve and then it goes away. Um, and so, you know, I'm calling on Musan um, to work with me and legislative and, and, and Penny, I mean, just please let's, let's not take our eyes off of what is the most, most, most essential uh, to our humanity uh, this next two years. And um, so our priorities are, are, you know, what has traditionally been a democratic platform. Uh, once you, you, we're looking at relief, we're, we're looking at relief, not just from COVID, but we're also looking at making sure access to affordable, you know, healthcare uh, is expanded and improved. Affordable housing, you'll see a lot of, a, a lot of work uh, has been done um, since March, since we adjourned on, on looking at housing and um, all of the other social determinants of, of health. Um, so a lot of, a lot of emphasis on, on housing. Um, we are gonna look at food insecurity. I mean, as you all know, this is one of the major um, health and access to food and well-being is the civil rights issue of our time, right? And so we're gonna be looking at food uh, insecurity uh, in, in, in the next two years. Um, the, you'll see in the governor's budget that she gave a little more um, relief uh, to municipalities because our cities and towns have really been hit hard, especially through COVID closing downs of businesses and the federal relief package that we um, are, are getting ready to have will bring some relief to municipalities, but the state needs to funnel some of that $7.6 billion back into our communities so that we don't raise property taxes. Um, so you'll see some of, of that. Um, there is a commitment not to raise property taxes by both the legislature and in the governor's budget. The governor's budget doesn't raise any income tax or sales taxes. As you know, the minute we raise sales tax, that's going to hit our poor people the most. Um, so there's no increase in, in income or sales tax. Um, the um, two, two reports will help... Um, will help frame and shape some of the legislature. There was uh, recommendations by the Economic Recovery Committee. Um, I'm not sure if you all have that report or access to that information, but that's the Governor's Economic Recovery Committee. You'll see that. Um, and also uh, in that is our 10-year economic development plan. And also the Maine Climate Council just came out with a, a, a massive report uh, trying to get us to clean energy and to uh, reduce our footprint. Um, all of those things you'll see. I um, just want to give you a tiny bit more, um, which is the way that we'll operate this year, uh, Zoom. Um, and in, in acknowledgement of the digital divide, there's also going to be a 1-800 number for people to bring their, put their testimonies, um, call your testimonies in. I would like for you all to know that yesterday we launched a, uh, through the NAACP, a policy uh, committee in the Maine State Prison and the Women's Reentry uh, Re Center. We now have men and women who are currently incarcerated in real time on Zoom meetings every other week, going to be able to shape policy, going to be able to uh, write testimony, going to be able to participate in this process. And we're working on making sure because of Zoom that our men and women who are incarcerated can offer testimony in real time. Um, so those are some of the, the, the updates from the legislature. Um, I don't know how much time I have. I don't want to be offensive to your schedule and could shift to talk about the permanent commission. Okay, um, the, uh, and I also um, want to send you, if you're interested, 
uh, there has been a list of priority bills that have been put forth within the criminal justice judiciary committees that has been prepared by ACLU, Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition, a number of other groups, recovery, uh, Maine recovery. I can send you that list of bills that folks have already started to identify um, if that would help you in any of your process in trying to discern some of the priorities. Um, so I can send you that list. Uh, I'll send it to Penny. So uh, the permanent commission uh, was established um, two years ago. We went into effect in March of this year. Uh, it's made up of 15 members, uh, four members of the tribal population. So there's not a monolithic Indian. Uh, they haven't tokenized uh, their participation. Um, we advise all three branches of government. We're an independent entity that can raise money on our own and we can submit legislation. The Permanent Commission um, is focused on uh, the elimination of structural racism. So it's a tall order, it's a big, 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 big order. Um, where we focus our attention is also through science and data and we are going um, looking at the disparities in each one of our systems and uh, trying to form both a community engagement and public education component, as well as what, what um, are the changes that we need to see in our policy. Um, we issued a report in September, I don't know if you're familiar with it, I can get it to you, um, in which we analyzed 454 bills that were remaining in the last legislative session um, to the degree that they would impact positively impact uh, the racial disparities. We came up with 20 bills out of 454. That's how deep it is, right? That's how deep it is. Only 20 bills out of 454 would have actually moved the needle. So this is where we need your help, right? This is where we need your help is, I mean, and 454 bills, you have to understand, were part of 2000 bills that, were, that went through this system. We have 1,700 bills we'll go through in the next two years. How many of them do you think were written with, within the lens of racial equity? That's our work. That's our work. And in light of what happened on Wednesday, where you saw, where you saw white nationalists, white supremacy, white power on full display without any shame, without any hesitancy, without any hesitancy, uh, that makes 20 bills out of 454 or conceivably 1,700. Even, even more, more, more critical that we stay on this. Um, so it, it, it feels like um, the enormity of the universe. And it matters, ultimately, it matters. Um, I see a question about tribal sovereignty. Um, yes, we are, uh, tribal sovereignty is a, a number one issue. It was the number one bill that the Permanent Commission identified that needed to be addressed. The number one bill was tribal sovereignty. Um, so very, very quickly, um, the tribe, there are uh, several tribal sovereignty uh, bills that came out of a tribal state task force um, that came before the committee I sat on previously before I came into leadership, which was judiciary. Um, we had a tribal state um, a task force that came out with a number of recommendations um, in areas that you would think about, land acquisition, tax, um, natural resources, uh, access to sustenance, um, fishing and, and fishing rights. And then, and then what we call uh, concurrent jurisdiction, jurisdictional issues that help highlight the independent nature of sovereignty. Uh, so last year we had one big bill. Um, this year we took that bill and we divided it. So um, the jurisdictional bill, the sovereignty bill, if you will, um, I'm sponsoring this year at the, uh, at the behest of the, of the tribes, of the tribal chiefs, but there will be a gaming bill, Representative Collins is sponsoring. There will be a taxation bill um, and there may be a land acquisition bill. Um, those bills are, are really, really important. And if you sign up as the interested party on judiciary, then you will get notification of when those tribal bills uh, come up. By the way, notification is considered two weeks, 14 days by the legislature. The public has a right to know two weeks in advance 
uh, what's going to be on a calendar so that you can prepare to, to join us in the debates. Um, I'll just check to see if there are any other questions. That's, that's right. The Environmental Partners Coalition um, Tribal Sovereignty Bill um, got the highest. Rachel, Rachel yep. I don't want you to have to worry about answering questions because people can ask the questions in the chat and then we will follow up with you and others to get back to folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you are much. so brilliant and inspirational and I'm ready. I'm ready to do the work. Thank you for leading us there. Thank you all for, um, for everything that you're doing. And I hope that um, as we move on um, that we stay together in this fight. So we will. We will. Appreciate the time here. Thank you. Thank you.